Good evening, everyone. Can people hear me in general? I hope. Helen Frink, I'm a board member of the Mill Hollow Heritage Association, and I'm the host for this evening's program. First of all, I'd like to tell you that our virtual programming is sponsored by the Federal CARES Act uh, through the New Hampshire Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. I'd like to welcome everyone to our Sense of Place event, part of our Stories from the Holler. And tonight's program features a woman ahead of her time, Mary Ware Dennett. She was the first wife of architect Hartley Dennett, who built Chase's Mill. Many of you know the story. And she was the mother of his sons, Carl and Devin Dennett. And I understand that we have members of the extended Dennett clan here tonight, which is wonderful. Um, she was very clearly a woman ahead of her time, and we'll learn all about that from Sharon Spaulding. Before we begin and introduce Sharon, a few sort of housekeeping details. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat function. If you would like to put in some questions or comments that we can take up at the end of about 40 minutes or so, by all means, type them in there. It's very easy to put in a message to everyone. And as we approach the end of the program, I should be able to see what you have typed in. And then we'll take up those questions in as much time as we have. Um, and so now, as we get ready to begin, I'd like to introduce Sharon Spaulding. Many of you know her, you're related to her perhaps. And Sharon is the president of the board of the Mill Hollow Heritage Association that owns Chase's Mill. And she spends summers, as you probably also know, in the Warren House in East Alstead. And she is the recipient of trunks and boxes full of the documents, memorabilia, and letters of Mary Ware Dennett. And she's going to tell us about this fascinating woman, a suffragist, a campaigner for birth control and for sex education, someone who's very, very clearly a woman ahead of her time. So let's turn it over to Sharon. Thanks, Helen. Um, well, first of all, I just want to extend also say thank you to everybody who's tuning in tonight. And um, I'd like to give a special shout out to the Dennett clan, in particular, Joanna Dennett, Nancy Dennett, and Peter Dennett. Um, Joanna, Nancy, and Peter are uh, Mary Ware's grandchildren. Um, and they're with us tonight. And at the end, you know, may want to chime in and, and have something uh, to add, you know, about their experience of her or a memory or something in particular. Um, so first of all, you know, again, thank you, because this is a woman I'm very passionate about. I have, I have been uh, really researching Mary Ware Dennett for the past 10 years. And, and by researching, I mean, I've been diving into letters, papers, journals, everything that was stored um, <clears throat> at the Warren House in uh, Mill Hollow, and also um, papers that came from Joanna's house, some from Peter's house, and quite a few from Margaret Perry's home as well. Um, so just to give you a little bit of an idea of who she was, she really and truly was a remarkable feminist and leader of the early women's rights movement in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, Time Magazine named her last March as one of America's nine most important women in American history that everybody should know. And yet really outside of academic circles, most people don't know, they've never heard her name. So I'm, I'm really hoping to change that. <clears throat> um, hoping to change that. <laughs> um, let's see. So some facts about her life. She was born in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1872. She died in New York in 1947. Um, in a resume that she wrote, towards the end of her life, she described herself as New England granite. And she wrote that although she had started or been involved with numerous reform organizations, <clears throat> that the thing that was the most important to her was craftsmanship. She considered herself first and foremost an artist and, um, and she was deeply concerned with the art of living. 
So at various times in her life, she was a leader in the arts and crafts movement in Boston in the 1890s. She was a leader in the suffrage movement from 1908 until about 1915. She was a leader in the reproductive rights movement and the founder of the first national birth control organization in 1915. Um, she was an early advocate for honesty in sex education and also what we would call sex therapy today. She was a leader in the peace movement prior to World War I and World War II. Um, there's even evidence that she was a co-founder of the organization that became the American Civil Liberties Union. And she was a champion for free speech. And it's um, really in large part thanks to Mary Ware Dennett that uh, James Joyce's Ulysses and other previously banned books were finally able to be published in the United States in the 1930s. So she was remarkable in many, many, many ways and very much a, um, a Renaissance woman and a woman ahead of her time. And Sharon, what, how is she exactly connected to Mill Hollow or to Chase's Mill? Well, so as you said, um, Mary Ware Dennett was Hartley Dennett's first wife and she never actually lived in Mill Hollow, but um, she, her parents, her mother was from Boscawen and she had visited Mill Hollow as a child. And, um, and even though she didn't live in Mill Hollow, she and Hartley had separated uh, when he moved uh, in 1910. Eventually her two sons, Carl and Devin, inherited homes uh, from Hartley after his death in 1936. Uh, one of those houses is the house that's still in our family. I married into that side of the family, uh, as many of you know. And uh, the other house uh, was known as the Three Bears in Ackworth. Um, and so Sharon, when you began to do this research, how did you find her papers? I understand Brendan has a photo for us showing what they looked like in your attic. Yeah. <laughs> Brenda, do you have that photo? So this is, oh, sorry, we back up for one minute, if you would, Brendan. Uh, yeah, so this is the Warren House, which I'm sure many of you will recognize. It's right across the street or almost directly across the street from, uh, from the mill. And um, this is the house that has, uh, that Carl Dennett inherited after his father Hartley died. And this is the house that is still in our family and where we go every summer. So, okay, next photo. Thanks. So um, initially, you know, this house, this is a big old house. It is it has trunks, steamer trunks in the attic, still has steamer trunks in the attic. And it still also has trunks in almost every room of the house. Um, and those trunks were filled with Mary's papers. So when she died um, in 1947, her papers were pretty much divided up between her two sons, between Carl and between Devin. And um, the papers that went to Carl ended up in the attic for the most part at the Warren house. However, I should add that, you know, the house is still really yielding up papers because you open a drawer or you look in a box or you, you look someplace that you're sure you've looked before and then suddenly here's a whole new stash of papers. Um, Sharon, what were her early influences? Tell us a little bit about her family and especially about her education. What made her the person that she became? Um, well, let's see. The I think her family first and foremost was uh was the biggest influence um brendan you can turn you know remove the slide at this point if you don't mind it's a little distracting thanks um <clears throat> so anyway her influences she came from such a tightly knit family they were just wonderful and uh, it's really been a, a privilege for me to read the papers that we have, um, even letters that were written by her mother that date to 1848. But eventually her father 
died from cancer when Mary was just 10 years old. And that left her mother and, and Mary's uh, three siblings. She had an older brother and a younger sister. They were pretty much penniless when he died. And um, Mar Mary's mother was very, very close to her three younger siblings. And none of those three siblings were married at that point. So Mary's family, her mother and her brother and sister moved in with Mary's two aunts and uncle. And the thing about them was, was that whole family was dedicated to hard work, um, they had a firm belief in uh, really following one's duty to one's fellow man and woman to making the world a better place. Um, they, as I, you know, were believers in education. And two, two of the aunts that she moved in with were um, very early feminists. One of them was an early graduate of MIT. She graduated in the 1880s as a chemist. And um, then the other was a reformer in her own right of, um, she was an education reformer and then later a suffragist and then later still founder of the um, Women's Peace Party. So it, they all had a big influence on, on her. Well, and how did she start her career in art? I understand she became part of the arts and crafts movement and that she herself was an artist. She was. Um, so the very earliest letters that I've seen um, that Mary wrote were from when she was just six years old. And even at the age of six, um, she wrote about wanting to be an artist. That was her life's ambition and her passion. And, and then as she, um, you know, even in her teens, she laments the fact that the family doesn't have enough money for drawing pencils or for her to have a real education in art. And eventually though, um, you know, she, her, her uncle marries and he marries an artist who then gives Mary instruction. So um, by the time, let's see, by 1891, she is admitted to the Boston School of Art and she uh, studies mostly, she finds that she has a, a real penchant for uh, design and, um, and she studies there and graduates two years later as a professor. She then becomes a professor of art at Drexel in Philadelphia and she works there for three years. She comes back to Boston and um, starts the revival of a craft of leather working called Guadamasile, um, which we'll show you some pictures of that in just a minute. But, um, but during this whole time, the arts and crafts movement had really started in England um, earlier and was, was started by uh, William Morris and by John Ruskin. And Mary had read them and studied them even as a child with her scholarly aunts, you know, who were also her tutors. Um, but that movement in particular was a reaction to, to the Industrial uh, Revolution and, and was, more, was really more about a lifestyle than art. Art became an expression of the philosophy. But it, it really, um, you know, it, as a reaction, the Industrial Revolution created cycles of poverty. It created um, a lot of, you know, horrible working conditions in factories. And, and the arts and crafts movement was ab about valuing things that are crafted by hand, about the idea that actually people could evolve, that it, as individuals we could become better people, as a society we could become uh, better and kinder to each other. Um, and, and it was about the idea of, you know, sometimes needing less rather than more of everything. So she became a, a leader in that movement. 
this sounds so incredibly close to some of the ideals of the Mill Hollow community. The idea of um, being opposed to the effects of the Industrial Revolution, creating a better society, living more simply, and a real reverence for handicrafts, the work of the hands. And it's so interesting that we seem to know so little about her or attribute so little to her when we think of what made Mill Hollow the progressive place that it was. But clearly she was an, an important figure and um, perhaps a, a, an influence on Hartley Dennett. I don't know whether you wanna show um, some of her work with the, the leather work or do you want to go um, into how she met Hartley and began? Well, no, let's, let's go to this. This is perfect. Okay. So one of the things that Mary did uh, in Boston in the 1890s was uh, helped to co-found the Boston Society for Decorative Arts, which actually just closed its doors two years ago, which is incredible. Um, and she then also uh, became the founder and the editor of a publication called Handicraft, which is, this is one of the things in the picture here. It was a very influential publication in the art community uh, at that time. And she edited, uh, this one I think is dated, I'm, I'm having to look in here, it's 1902. Mm -hmm. um, so she was the regular editor. And then she also, her for her own choice of artwork, um, the, the, this, this process of working leather um, was something that she had seen on a trip to Europe. And, you know, we're not talking like little belts and things like that. I mean, she created these massive um, wall coverings, beautiful decorative screens like the one you see here. This is all made from leather. So this is hand tooled. I think we have a close up of it too. Brendan, could you go to the next slide perhaps? Let's see, yeah. So you can get a sense of the color um, and the amount of work that went into a piece like this. And is this the time in her life when she became um, acquainted with Hartley Dennett or did that happen earlier? Did, no, they actually, meet, did they meet in Boston? He was a student at MIT. Yes, yes. So they did meet, um, they had met by at least by 1893. Mm. And um, I think probably earlier than that, but um, she, not, not long after the first uh, entry, which appears in a journal of Hartley's where it, it, it's just a one-liner lunch with Miss Ware, it, you know, Mary at the time is Mary Ware. And, um, and then shortly after that, then she leaves and goes to Drexel for three years as a professor. But they really fell in love, I think, through their letters. I mean, they had, um, they had a lot in common. They both considered themselves very shy. Um, and they both wanted to change the world. They both had experienced the loss of their fathers at about the age of 10. Hartley had also lost um, one or two siblings. And that, you know, so they just, they hit it off. And, and in their letters, it's, it's fun to read uh, those, those letters over the time when she's away in Philadelphia because they start off very formally, you know, dear Mr. Dennett, my dear Miss Ware, and then pretty soon it, it becomes dear Mary and dear Hartley, and then it's dear heart and dear Mary mine kind of thing. And then they're engaged um, actually to, in the second year, by the end of the second year when she's in Philadelphia, they are engaged. And um, she seems, first of all, a couple of things seem odd to me about her. First, you said that she was shy and yet she became a, a um, champion of women's suffrage and really put herself in the front row of uh, sex education, which is remarkable. And surely it was uncommon at that time for a woman to become a professor <laughs> at a university at the age of 21. That's truly exceptional, really yeah. remarkable. It is, it is. And the other thing about that too, that I just wanna underscore is that, you know, she, I mean, she was really passionate about art and, um, you know, to think that she had graduated at the age of 21, she becomes self-supporting, doing what she loves. When she returns to Boston 
and is a co-founder of the Arts and Crafts Society. She's also producing her own work and she's getting rave reviews with her exhibitions. She's selling her artwork. She's very, um, you know, she's just living her dream. And, I, you know, back to Mill Hollow for a second, I, I really think that she was the one, I mean, they had a lot in common, certainly. I don't wanna undermine Hartley in any way, but Hartley during this period is more, um, really strikes me as more the angst filled young man who's trying to discover his path and his purpose. And at this time, he really wants to be a poet and a farmer, uh, even though he has trained as an architect and graduated from Harvard and MIT. And I, I think that, that, you know, I think she was the one who really had a lot of influence in cementing those ideals in him or instilling and kind of forming those those ideas in him. And then Sharon, they did marry and fairly soon after their marriage, their first son was born and uh -huh. then their second son. Tell us about f family life and the impact of having children on Mary. Well, first of all, we have a great photo of that too. So yep. Okay, so this is a picture of Mary on the left, of course. Uh, she's holding Devon, who was born in 1905, and then behind, behind Devon is Carl, and then that's Hartley on the right. Um, so they started off, they were just, you know, I think Mary was, at least for Mary, she was, she had found really the man of her dreams, and they were working together. Um, at some point, he settled on architecture and they started a business together. They had a, um, a business where supposedly he was the one designing the homes and then, or, you know, as the architect, and then she was the one designing and decorating them. But there are references in some of her journals where she says that, uh, that they were a very modern couple and they considered themselves to be an architect. They always split the income. She managed and supervised uh, the builders and the, the subcontractors as much as he did. And, um, you know, they were both sought after in terms of uh, speaking engagements and things like that. So they, they bought property in Framingham and um, had a large orchard. They built a great studio and a, the house of their dreams. And, but they were still close enough to Boston that they could commute in, you know, as they needed to for work. And how did this, how did this relationship um, end so unhappily for Mary? It, it sounds like she had such an investment in this complete partnership, an artistic partnership, a financial partnership, as well as a family. Well, she did. And, um, and I didn't answer part of your question. I just realized an important part. Uh, she had a terrible time in childbirth, and she actually gave birth to three sons. Uh, the second one died just a few weeks after he was born. But um, after that second child was born, the doctor said, you, you cannot have any more children. You have to abstain from sex because you will probably die in childbirth. And... Now, you know, you might ask the question, well, wait a minute, why would they have to abstain from sex? But the thing to know is that at this period in time, there were laws called the Comstock laws, which uh, prohibited, made, rendered all information about contraception and all devices, all contraceptive devices were illegal under US federal law. Those laws had been enacted in 1873. They were not fully struck down until the late 1960s um, and some would even argue into the 1970s. So that's why they had to abstain. Now about this time, I think it was around 1904, they uh, were commissioned, they were hired by Margaret Chase and her husband, Dr. Lincoln Chase to build a home. And um, the four of them became friends. The Chases had, uh, oh, we're not quite there yet, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, the Chases had two children, Heman and Mary, who were roughly the same ages as Carl and Devin. 
and uh, you know, the two families vacation together in Elstead. Um, but after Devon's birth, Mary, you know, Mary became almost an invalid for a time and had to go to New York for surgeries and then for a several month convalescence. And while she was gone, basically Margaret and Hartley uh, fell in love. So she comes back from, from New York. Uh, she realizes what's happening. And, and then, you know, it just kind of evolved. She tries to save her marriage, um, but Hartley was really a, a, you know, a follower of Tolstoy. Uh, he was a believer in the back to the land tradition of Emerson and Thoreau. And both he and Margaret declared that their love was a higher love. It was a higher spiritual love and um, that they had really a duty to God to follow that spiritual love. So incredibly, Lincoln Chase agreed and they decided to move to Alstead where the Chases had property. Um, they wanted Mary to come join them with, of course, their two children. And she said, hell no, I am not doing that. So at that point, you know, it was clear the marriage was over. Um, 1908, they are officially separated. Mary files for custody and incredibly gets custody of her two children. And now we want to see the picture of the Alstead soulmates, that scandalous yeah. <laughs> People magazine type headline um, photo that made them famous, I think, all over the United States. Yeah. Uh, but, so this I, is just, yeah, this one is actually from 1915, but um, the, the custody, so you'll see, first of all, in the background is the brick house, which today is owned by the Aikens but that is, that's where Hartley and Margaret and Lincoln lived. Um, Lincoln would go back and forth between his practice in Framingham and, and, and then up to Alstead. But this kind of publicity, the, the custody battle in 1908 was brutal because Hartley refused an attorney. Um, and, and frankly, he just, people thought he was really off the deep end. He was for a period of time disowned by his mother, his brother, even Margaret Chase's mother uh, was appalled, you know, by this, by this whole scenario. And um, so the publicity, it, it just was brutal and it was really hard for Mary and something that haunted her throughout the rest, well, throughout her career as a suffragist and initially in reproductive rights, you know, when she, uh, founded the first birth control organization. Sharon, as we still have this picture up, um, the photographs on the bottom of this um, newspaper of soulmates in Alstead, on the left is Hartley, in the middle is Margaret Chase, and on the right is Lincoln Chase. Yep. And Lincoln Chase and Margaret Chase were Heman's parents. And I had not realized that Lincoln actually lived with Margaret and with Hartley in the brick house for a time. Yes, he did. And then later Hartley built him or remodeled for him the house near the Vilas pool with those Correct. very characteristic dorms. I think that's true. But anyway, I had not realized that this was literally a menage a trois in the brick house. Yes. That's, that's a story in itself. Okay. Yeah, they always claimed that it was spiritual, you know, that there yes. was, <laughs> wasn't a matter of no sex here. But anyway, who knows? <laughs> Um, and then is this one of the things that made um, Mary Ware then a, a suffragist and a campaigner for women's rights and birth control? This is a painful, painful acrimonious divorce must have had an enormous effect on her emotions and everything. Oh, it did. It did. And it was really brutal. I mean, you know, we look at a newspaper clipping like this today and we kind of laugh because, um, you know, it was so scandalous at the time, but, but the thing you forget or the thing worth remembering is, is that, um, you know, for Mary, this was absolutely devastating. Um, Hartley, I think was out of anger, refused to give her any money to support the children. So he actually even stuck her with a lot of um, 
with household debts that uh, you know he just refused to pay. Um, it it was also a thing where you know the thing that how she identified herself as an artist she just she couldn't bring herself to pick up her pencils anymore and and uh, because it, her artwork was just too bound up with him and their work together so but she needed an income. And the other thing about the fact that what that custody battle that was so remarkable is that in 1908, you have to really remember what it was like for women. You know, women could not vote. Women were uh, in, in many states could not have a separate income. Mm -hmm. They could not own property. They had no recourse if they were married to an abusive husband. They, they had absolutely no rights. And children were considered to be the property of the father because at that time, it was considered that, you know, you could never give the children to the mother because a woman of good moral character could never support them. So it, it was just brutal uh, on many fronts and she needed an income. So by this time, one of her two feminist aunts is now head of the Massachusetts Suffrage Association. And she hires Mary and Mary takes off. And I think, you know, it gave her life a whole new focus, a whole new purpose, a new meaning. Um, and it gave her an income. How significant was she in the movement for women's suffrage? Very. We know the big names like Alice Paul and some of the other women. What was her position there exactly? Well, in Massachusetts, she became the corresponding secretary. So she was always crisscrossing the state. And uh, she found, everybody discovered that, wow, this woman can organize and she's a, she's a consensus builder. And as you pointed out, even though she was shy, she was very courageous because she would start speaking and then people would listen. And so pretty soon um, the national headquarters in New York took note and started trying to recruit her. In, um, in 1910, they finally convinced her to move to New York. She, she ended up leaving her two boys uh, mostly with her mother. And, um, and by that time, then they were in boarding school, but, um, but she went to New York and then she became the second in command of the National American Woman Suffrage Association. She, um, you know, back to the, she actually didn't divorce Hartley until 1913, but one of the things, one of the issues that plagued her and haunted her there was she had to keep a low profile because she was always afraid that Hartley could take those kids back from her at any point if he were to press his legal even though she had custody, he could still, as the father, come in and press, you know, for return of those children. But she, once she got to New York, um, the movement at the time, you know, had, had started really in 1848 with Lucretia Coffin Mott, and who, by the way, was a distant relative. Yeah. Well, not so distant. She had been like a great or a great, great aunt of Mary Ware's and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. And by 1910, nothing is happening. You know, there are, it's just, the movement is completely stalled out. There's no new states are enfranchising women. Um, it, it, there's a lot of political infighting. And Mary, uh, again, brings her organizational skills and her consensus building to bear and, and, and starts bringing in states, ratifying votes for women um, initially. Then in, in 1913 was the big march, the first imp really big march on Washington DC, Women's March. Um, and I think we have a picture, maybe we should put the picture up of Mary um, as a suffragist. Yep, so here she is. Now this is 1913. And um, the Women's March, let me just, I wanna to refer to my notes here a little bit on this. The, the March, so I'm sure everybody here will recall the March a few years back when Donald Trump um, 
was in the day before his inauguration and women marched on Washington and in cities all across the country. Um, what they were paying tribute to in, a, in one way was this march in 1913 that had been organized to really upstage Woodrow Wilson's um, inauguration. In those days, the presidents were inaugurated in the spring rather than the way they are now in January. But uh, Mary was very instrumental in helping to organize that march. It, it, Alice Paul rightly gets the, you know, the lion's share of the credit for that, organizing that march. But at the end of the day, there were over 5,000 women that came together, not just from across the United States, but from around the world. Women came from countries where they had already won the right to vote. And um, the idea was to march, be, have this march on Saturday before his inauguration on Sunday so that they could capture the headlines um, and bring you know, more attention to suffrage. Woodrow Wilson also was a misogynist and very, very much opposed uh, to women's suffrage, even though he ends up later being the one who signs the 19th Amendment into law. But um, let's see, do we have another photo there? Or is it the photo of, uh, I'm, I don't, I don't want to miss, Sharon, your photo of the telegram to Alice Paul. That's oh, a that's, part of the story yeah. also, because okay, well, it sounds like Mary Ware really worked very hard for diversity and equality within the women's movement. She did. And, and um, in fact, I think that's the next, I think it's the next picture, Brendan. Do you have the... The telegram to Alice Paul. There we go. There we are. So <clears throat> one of the things, you know, that has come up as we've celebrated the centennial of uh, the 19th Amendment, the, you know, this, this recently, last August, um, has been a lot of concerns have been expressed about the fact, you know, that so many women still were disenfranchised, even though the 19th Amendment was passed giving women the right to vote. Um, that there was that there was a history of racism within the suffrage movement. And one of the things about Mary Ware Dennett is that she was always on the right side of history. Um, this, let's see, I wanted to read something else actually, even before this telegram. Um, so I'm gonna read you something before this. She had sent a letter to Alice Paul in January of 1913. This march was to take place in, in March of 1913, so just a couple months later. And she says, um, there, I've been told that there's been an application from the colored women for a section in the parade and suggested that they be asked to withdraw by some tactful people on the committee. I told this woman it was absolutely impossible to endorse any such plan, that the suffrage movement stands for enfranchising every single woman in the United States, and that there was no occasion when we would be justified in not living up to our principles. This woman said she was not speaking for herself, but on behalf of those who fear that it might prejudice the success of the parade. I am quite certain I am speaking for the national when I say that we should not be doing right to let any such fear control our actions and that the DC committee can be counted on to do the square thing. However, you know, this is a rebuke to Alice Paul to cut it out and to include everybody. And then just days before the parade, she sent that telegram, which reads, am informed that parade committee has so strongly urged colored women not to march that it amounts to official discrimination, which is distinctly contrary to instructions from national headquarters. Please instruct all marshals to see that all colored women who wish to march shall be accorded every service given to other marchers. Uh, again, that's a tribute to a very rare point of view yes. for this woman ahead of her time. Sharon, we're moving on and we want to make sure we have time for questions at the end, but we don't want to shortchange 
her work in um, reproductive rights, so her advocacy for sex education, that the title of the pamphlet that she wrote, The Sex Side of Life. I, I really want to hear about that. Well, yeah, so very, very quickly, um, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll kind of bridge to that quickly. Um, by 1915, Mary had uh, had just become tired of a lot of the political infighting at the National Suffrage Association, including the, the whole constant fighting over do we include all women or are we talking about white women only? And she also began to see that really women's rights was a much bigger issue than only getting the vote. You know, there were many, many aspects to it. So in 1915, she started the first national birth control organization, which was intended to really do two things. It was intended primarily to get people talking openly about sex and, and to bring what was this hidden conversation out and, and actually make it okay to talk about. And also it was formed to lobby Congress to change the laws that these Comstock laws that uh, rendered all contraceptive information and devices illegal. And at the time you could be fined $5,000 for giving out that information. Even doctors couldn't talk to their patients about it. So along the way, that's, that's really what occupies her life for the next until about 1925. But along the way, she wrote a pamphlet for her two sons who were then teenagers called The Sex Side of Life, An Explanation for Young People, and illustrated it with anatomically correct drawings. Now, it, eventually it was published by the Medical Review of Reviews, and it was won all kinds of critical acclaim. Um, uh, lots of schools, universities, churches, the YMCA would buy copies from her and then you know, distribute them to their students. And um, you could write to Mary and send her a quarter, and then she would mail you a copy of The Sex Side of Life. Well, around about 1925, her lobbying efforts came to a close, and she conceded defeat. She was not able to get the legislation passed. She retires officially, picks up her artwork again, and then one morning in January of 1929, Literally, she opens an envelope to discover that she has been indicted. She shows up in court and she has been indicted for sending obscene material through the US mail, which is this particular pamphlet. The ACLU of which, again, there's evidence that she's a co-founder rises to her defense. She is tried and convicted, but wins her case on appeal. And when she wins on appeal, it sets a legal precedent that does lots of things. For one thing, it allows publication. It becomes the case that is cited again by the ACLU, um, which enables publication of Joyce's Ulysses and, and lots of books that had been banned, mostly books that were on sex education or, or dealt with sex. Um, Oh, and I forget now the second thing I was going to say, but this, anyway, this picture is Mary on the right, James Joyce on the left, and then uh, Morris Ernst, who was the attorney from the ACLU who represented them both. And again, that seems so contemporary somehow, this idea of what doctors can discuss with their patients, for example, and the freedom to find out the basic um, facts of life seems very significant. Well, we're dealing with these issues today, you know, reproductive mm -hmm. rights, not even, uh, forget abortion even for the minute, but mm -hmm. access to contraception is under attack and women are losing that battle. Insurance companies are not covering it and companies mm -hmm. have been given the right to deny women uh, insurance that will cover contraception. It's crazy. I, I think we're just at the point to um, take some questions and perhaps we could start with the descendants of Mary Ware Dennett today. I think you mentioned that Peter and Nancy and Joanna Dennett were with us this evening. Can we hear from them? And can Brendan perhaps let us see them as well? I don't never really knew Mary Ware very well because 
I was a child and I briefly saw her a little bit in the mid forties. And actually I was told that I was the last person that she recognized before she died. Huh. Um, but beyond that, I know very little about her and, you know, um, because I didn't really know her. I wasn't connected with her as a, a member of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But Nancy knows a lot more. Good. Is Nancy here? I thought she was. Nancy? I'm here. Hi, oh. Pete. Hi, Mariana. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I was older than Pete. Uh, so um, I knew her a lot better than Pete. Um, she used to draw me these little pictures uh, and send me letters with these little tiny artworks. And um, she made me shoes out of leather, which was wow. so comfortable. And she used to embroider little velvet um, dresses um, for me and Joanna and Sally. Um, mm -hmm. And um, she was a, a, a little bit of a remote figure, even though she would come up to um, my home, um, but she was still a little bit scary for me and Joanna. <laughs> Not so much Joanna because she lived right near her, but you know, all those qualities that she had, which were so many, um, <laughs> also had a downside, you know, where she was a little bit hard to, um, I don't know, get to know maybe, um, but I, I know she loved me very much. So that was good. Anyway, she was a, such an interesting person. And as I got older, I realized all the um, sacrifices that she had made um, for um, everybody in her family. And my dad still, uh, and Devin still had um, feelings about that very strongly. So I got a lot of that from their angle. Anyway, a very, very interesting person. Thanks, Nancy. <clears throat> Joe or Wendy, does Joe want to say anything? I remember Mary Morgan very well. <laughs> she, she always made uh, my sisters Sally and my cousin Nancy velvet dresses every year. She made them and embroidered them and it was another one of her many talents. Do you, that? Do you have any, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any other memories of Mary Ware when she was living with you on, uh, in Woodside? Well, she'd begun to have failed then. Yeah. She was pretty That's old then. Right, Joe? Joe, I remember. What was that? Sorry. Nancy, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm just going to mention that she got very ill. She had a lot of strokes. And, and so I don't think she was really herself the last few years of her life. Um, she ended up in a nursing home. She, she had a difficult uh, situation. Um, and uh, her oldest granddaughter, Sally Bennett, she knew her the best. She, she took care of her in the nursing home. And, um, but she died. So we don't have an advantage there for us. <laughs> I, what I was going to say is that, um, Joe, one time you told me that her favorite expression was, uh, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I love that expression. It just, especially in the kind of the crazy political times that we're living in. And uh, the fact that here we are a hundred years later and we're still fighting, we're still fighting racism. We're, st you know, we haven't even begun to really uncover all of the racism uh, that has, you know, just run through our our history. Um, 
we're fighting for reproductive rights. Uh, we're, we still are fighting these same battles. And um, anyway, I find myself often remembering her words, uh, tie, when you get to the end of your rope, tie a knot and hang on. That's a beautiful expression. I wonder if um, Ellen Chase and Margaret Perry are here and whether they have any memories of Mary Ware at all. I've never asked them that. Uh, I never met her. I she I think she died. What year did she die? Um, 47. 47, yeah. Oh, well, I, I was born in 39. But if I did meet her, I was too young to uh, to know to appreciate anything about her. I have no recollection whatsoever. Sadly, uh, maybe Margaret remembers. I think she doesn't actually if she's listening in. She said something about how she does not remember her either. I think those the, those of us who were born too late to have known her missed a great woman. Sharon, it's been a wonderful, wonderful evening. And I thank you for sharing the story with us. Um, Sharon's going to stay online for a little bit longer. So if people would like to ask Sharon some more questions or have other comments about Mary Ware Dennett, she's going to stay with us for a few more minutes. Otherwise, I think that this event is pretty much at an end, but we're very gratified by your participation. And we thank you for your interest in Chase's Mill and in all the stories that surround it. And, and uh, Helen, thank you. And also, um, I know there are, I think there's like, there's, wow, I have to put my glasses back on, 23 comments in the chat room. No, I can't um, see them all, Sharon. So let's just see. Um, I'm looking for, oh, Ogden, let's see, so. <laughs> can, I, can I say that one? Uh. Margaret. Yes, go ahead, Margaret. Yes, um, I understand that um, Ogden Nash wrote, um, I for one would think the world better run if Mary Ware Dennett explained things to the Senate. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I like that other one. I'd rather read the proceedings of the United States Senate than listen to a speech by Mary Ware Dennett. <laughs> I'm not sure where that one came from. I haven't heard that, but that's great. <laughs> yeah, Sasha, Sasha just told it. Put that on. <laughs> Let's just see. Oh, okay. Uh, a lot of people saying hi. It's nice. Oh, and I'm sorry, I didn't see the note to move closer to the computer. Um, I was, questions, comments? Hi, hi, Sharon, it's Lynette. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. This was so fascinating and it's it's just like delightful to hear about um, folks from our neck of the woods. Um, and my question was going to be, if she were alive today, what do you think she would say to those of us who are in this current time, but you kind of answered it with that, not at the end of the rope, but I wonder if you have anything <laughs> to say about like her advice to us now. Oh, I, you know, I think she would be at the front of every protest for women's rights, but not, not only for women's rights, but for equal rights. Um, she, you know, one of the things I, I didn't say is that she was such a believer in fulfilling the promises of the Declaration of Independence. And that's something that actually goes back to Lucretia Coffin Mott at, at the Declaration of Sentiments and Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. But Mary, Mary Ware really took it to heart. She loved this country. She was a firm believer in people's rights and she was a firm believer in leveling the playing field for all. So as long as there was an injustice, it was worth, you know, get out there and fight it. Make, make a change. Change the laws. Um, do the right thing. And, um, you know, I, she, also, she also wasn't, you know, she wasn't... Um, 
let's see, what am I trying to say? She was as much for rights for men as for women. But she said this great thing about feminism. And I, and I would like to just read it to you very quickly. It's over a page long. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But she says, women are people. That is perhaps the shortest possible explanation of what feminism stands for. Feminism is not the lining up of women against men. Feminism does not imply that women want things as women. They only want to do things, have things, and feel things as people, as half the human race on equal terms with the other half. So I, I love that. I love that statement from her. Anyway, Sharon, she's out there it, leading the charge. <laughs> it, it sounds from looking at the chat messages like you already have a ready-made audience for your book. People want to know when this is going to be in print. Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> I wish I had a crystal ball. It is basically um, written. I, I have written the book as historical fiction. Um, and I have based it on those, you know, mostly the her journal entries, her unpublished manuscripts, her most private letters. Um, but I've written it as historical fiction because I, I wanted to make certain leaps of faith that I just couldn't, you know, verify with, with facts. I don't have an agent yet. And that's the thing. I'm seeking representation by an agent uh, for a publishing house. And, I, and I'm hard at work on that. I'm also... Um, in the process, I'm going to be starting a newsletter um, that will deal not only with Mary, but also uh, other voices of women who have been forgotten, who've made a difference in history and, and then been forgotten. Um, so you can go to my website and give me your email address there, and then I can get you on my mailing list. I, I hope to get that out in the next, get it started anyway within the next month. Can you put your website on our Facebook page? Sure, I can. It's it's yeah, very wonderful. simple too. It's SharonSpalding.com okay. and Spalding has a U. Good. And there, there is an email capture at the bottom. And if you sign up, I'll I promise you'll be getting the newsletter when it comes. And you'll good. and you'll be hearing about the book. <laughs> good, good. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for your attention and for your enthusiasm for this project. Thank you again, and good night. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, -bye. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.